Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for having my conversation on William Spears Bruce, Scottish oceanographer and Antarctic polar explorer. It is rather sad to consider that the festival that we are holding is European, as it marks the six months presidencies of Slovenia. And yet Scotland is now out of the European Union, despite voting overwhelmingly in favour of remaining part of the EU in the referendum of 2016. William Spears Bruce uh, was, is considered the greatest polar scientist and oceanographer of the 20th century. A good reason for talking about him today is that only a few days ago, on October 28, it was the 100th anniversary of his death, and there was no recognition of this, not even in Scotland, his native land, where I am at the moment attending the COP26. Sadly, W.S. Bruce and the remarkable scientific work that he did is mostly forgotten. Uh, as this book published in 2018 indicates, he is the forgotten polar hero. So let's get to know better William Spears Bruce. Born in London, his father was a surgeon from Scotland. Uh, he enrolled at University College London to study medicine, like his father at the age of 20. But when he went to Edinburgh on vacation courses in natural sciences, he got really taken by the science behind that and uh, was very taken by the contemporary excellent scientists that he got in touch with. And so he decided to transfer to Edinburgh to study medicine. And in the meantime, he worked on various laboratory and became interested in oceanography and learned the principles of scientific investigation. Um, there's a series of time that he spent uh, working with the natural sciences, made him more interested in the scientific investigation method. The Dundee whaling expedition to Antarctica was the first one he took part in, in 1892-93, left him disillusioned as the scientific results of the voyage were, according to him, a miserable show. On the contrary, his second Arctic encounter of 1896-97 uh, was far more positive. This Jackson Harmworth expedition gave Bruce the chance to meet and spend time with the most famous and respected explorer of the time, the Norwegian Fridtjof Nansen. Fridtjof Nansen had been rescued by Jackson after spending a winter with one companion on what is now called Jackson Island. What happened was that his ship, the Fram, was deliberately frozen in the polar ice in 1893 in order to study the drift of the Arctic ice. He was hoping that the Fram would be close to the North Pole, but when this did not happen in, in 1895, Nansen and his companion Jalmar Johansen left the Fram and tried to reach the North Pole on skis. Beaten by the polar drift in ice, they took refuge for the winter and were saved by Jackson. Another chance meeting that helped Bruce in his polar quest when he was employed on a hunting expedition to Svalbard on the steam yacht Blencathra uh, with the Major Andrew Coates. Uh, the family of Coates, of Major Coates, was the wealthy industrialist firm of thread manufacturers. They sailed through the Barents Sea and Bruce began meteorological and other observations and also began tow netting and trawling for biological samples. In June, Blaine Cathra made two landings in the southwest of Novaya Zambia. And in July, the expedition to the ship along the edge of the pack ice, almost to Novaya Zambia, dredging, tow netting and trawling continually and charting the ice edge. After the expedition, Bruce published his natural history observation and his record of deep sea soundings in the Barents Sea. Uh, while in Tromso, Bruce was introduced to the Grimaldi, Albert Grimaldi. So this was Andrew Coates.
he was introduced uh, to Albert Grimaldi, which later, who later became, became Prince Albert I of Monaco and the great grandfather of Prince Rainier III of Monaco. He was an oceanography an oceanography enthusiast. He founded the Oceanographic Institute in Monaco and Paris, as well as the very famous Oceanographic Museum in Monaco, which later became famous, became famous through the work of Jacques Cousteau, its director from 1957 to 1988. The Oceanographic uh, research ship Princess Alice Bruce, we see, is on the extreme right here. And he was invited to join the prince on a hydrographic survey around Spitsbergen. And the following year, he was also invited again uh, because he became a close friend of the Grimaldis that really supported his scientific research. There is Bruce again. Uh, we, uh, this brings us to the heroic age of exploration, when Antarctica became the focus of geographical and scientific exploration after the Sixth International Geographical Congress of 1895. A British national Antarctic expedition became the sole focus of Sir Clements Markham, that we see here, the president of the Royal Geographical Society. It had to be led by a young Royal Navy Lieutenant, Robert Falcon Scott, and it would be a Royal Navy accomplishment, mainly to conquer the South Pole. Bruce, at that time, was the most accomplished polar scientist and oceanographer, so it was logical that he should propose himself to be part of the scientific staff when the British National Expedition was announced in 1899. He was kept waiting for over a year, and uh, therefore he started searching for funds for his own Scottish National Antarctic Expedition. Markham was incensed as he felt that a second expedition would detract from the main British one. And the initial reaction of the Royal Geographical Society, well, Clement Markham, was to call him, accuse him of mischievous rivalry. Um, but thanks to the generous backing of the Coates brothers, who donated £30,400 out of the 36405 that were the total funds raised, early in 1902, Bruce could buy a ship. On the advice of the polar explorer Fridtjof Nansen, Bruce acquired the Norwegian whaler Hekla, which was then renamed Scotia. This was converted for its new purpose in accordance with the plans of the naval architect George L. Watson, who gave his services free. The ship underwent refurbishment at the Elsa shipyard in Troon in Ayrshire to make it stronger for the Antarctic back ice. Uh, the Scotia, we see here its uh, characteristics, is a bark rigged auxiliary screw steamer of 100 tons, long, 42.7 meters long and 8.8 .8 meters wide, and it could achieve a maximum speed of seven knots. Um, we see that uh, uh, as Bruce had narrowly missed the chance of going with Captain Scott on the British Antarctic Nation, British National Antarctic Expedition of 1902-1904, um, uh, and had been refused funding for his own expedition by the British government, uh, he was actually very determined to emphasize the Scottish character of his enterprise. Bruce was a strong nationalist. This is reflected in his choice of the Scottish National Tactic Expedition as the name and the use of the St. Andrew's flag, the saltire, occasionally also used the Union flag in several of the photographs taken on the expedition. The expedition even had an official piper playing the bagpipes in the Antarctic. And this is what Bruce said, while science was the talisman of the expedition, Scotland was emblazoned on its flag, 
and it may be that in endeavoring to serve humanity by adding another link to the golden chain of signs, we have also shown that the nationality of Scotland is a power that must be reckoned with. Definitely a strong nationalist statement there. And uh, we see here Bruce and the personnel of Scotia. They were all Scottish people. There wasn't anybody from outside Scotland. And uh, uh, there was a very strong scientific group. Uh, names that were all Scottish, David Wilton, the zoologist, uh, Robert Mossman, the scientist, the botanist, Rodman Brown, and uh, the geologist, Harry Peary. The artist and the taxidermist are not in this particular piece. So the Scotia leaves for the Arctic, for the Antarctic, under the command of Captain Thomas Robertson of Peterhead and the overall readership of the expedition organizer, William S. Bruce. And the Scotia sailed from Troon, passing from Glasgow on the River Clyde on 2nd November 1902. The plan of the expedition the plan of the expedition was to um, explore the Weddell Sea area. This is the whatever little was known of the Antarctic at the beginning of the last century. And we can see here that uh, uh, among the, uh, the islands that were very useful were uh, the Orkney Islands. In this map, we see that uh, Bruce had the idea to get as far south as possible in the Weddell Sea which was really very little known, and explore also the islands nearby, whereby we can see the South Orkney Islands. Why are these important? Because um, he used one of the South Orkney Islands, Lorry Island, as the base for his meteorological observatory. After several stopovers, um, the South Orkneys were sighted on the 4th of February 1903 and the landing was made on Saddle Island, a, a tiny island that had been first discovered in 1838. Um, the South Orkneys had been named by James Weddell in 1823, but no survey had ever been done. And uh, they set off south to enter the Weddell Sea. They struggled through the pack ice um, slowly reaching the maximum farther south of just over 70 degrees, 25. The last 25 minutes of latitude took a week to cover. And the decreasing daylight and falling temperature that had the arrival of winter made uh, uh, them think that it was very wise to go back and repair to the South Orkney Islands, to Lorry Islands. This is a hand-drawn up map of Lorry Island, which is very interesting because it's uh, absolutely as it was mapped by them. And uh, they settled for to build this hut and observatory on this little isthmus here. That seemed to be the best way because the ship could be uh, access and left in Scotia Bay, which was a, a very deep and very protected bay to spend the winter, and also having another access by the sea on Jesse Bay. They also noticed that the winds were not blowing very much in that uh, northwest direction, north, northwest southeast direction. So that also made sense to have the, this hut built there. Now, this is the ship in winter quarters where it was packed with ice so that it would be protected and kept warm. And in fact, the life on board was quite pleasant and dignified. Um, this hut uh, for the um, for living and for the uh, meteorological observatory was called the Elmond House after Robert Trail Elmond. 1858 to 1914, a Scottish physicist, geologist, and meteorologist who has set up the Ben Nevis Observatory. 
and it was built with local stones that were quarried one by one from the rocks nearby. Very, very hard, backbreaking work. And they had the mattresses, stoves, hammocks installed along the wooden floor. And uh, the intention was also that this would be used by a party remaining the following summer when the Scotia sailed south to the Weddell Sea again. This we see um, sort of quite pleasant uh, Omond house uh, seems to be. And the men settled into a winter routine. Uh, they surveyed the island. Uh, this is the second largest island in the South Orkney group. And the winter passed peacefully, apart from the death of the first engineer who had a heart condition. He was only 25. And, uh, and then we can see that penguins, they had ample food, the penguins had been taken the previous autumn, and then in, with the spring there was an abundance of animal life coming uh, in the island, making the whole um, expedition quite pleasant. So there were sledging journeys, we can see people uh, on skis as well, and, uh, we, and they had dog teams, there was grass on the island, lichens, the nature of rocks also was interesting, and they uh, thought that they might be part of um, Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego. And in fact, it's been proven that it's part of the Scotia Arc that reaches from South Georgia, the South Sandwich Islands, the South Orkneys, and it connects with Antarctic Peninsula as well. And this is uh, the interior of the hut. Now we can see here what. Um, Bruce did in late November. Um, the party of six was left at Oman House while uh, Bruce uh, went north again. They had to repair the ship and they went to Buenos Aires. And it was actually here, while in Argentina, that Bruce negotiated an agreement with the Argentinian government whereby Oman House became a permanent weather station under Argentinian control. Uh, the Argentinians renamed it Orcadas, which is Orkney in Spanish. The site has been continuously in operation since then and provides the longest historical meteorological series of Antarctica. This action caused the consequences that are still felt to this day. In fact, it gave Argentina the basis for its land claims to that part of Antarctica. Because of the Antarctic Treaty, all claims are frozen, but it could be potentially a problem in the future. Returning to Lori Island, the men had to rebuild one wall of Almond House as it started to collapse in the summer thaw. They had actually built it on permafrost and not on rock, as they had thought. Uh, they also devised a rationing plan because just in case the Scotia did not return, which was a very real prospect in those days, early days of polar exploration, when the sea ice wasn't really well known and it was possible for a ship to be crushed and sunk. This didn't actually happen and uh, the Scotia uh, went back to Lori Island and then arrived on the 22nd of February, 1904, with fresh supplies, and also with three Argentinians that were going to take over the running of the meteorological station. And the plan was to leave for another season, two members of the Sco Scotia expedition to teach them how to, to manage the, the observatory and they would be picked up uh, the following year by the Argentinian, by ship of the Argentinian government, which in fact is what happened. And uh, on the 31st of December, 1904, the Argentinian naval ship Uruguay relieved them and they went back to, Sco to Scotland. And as I said, it is the longest base uh, occupied in Antarctica. Then the Scotia really wanted to achieve what it, the whole purpose was, which was to uh, study the Weddell Sea. And uh, the, the season was luckier than the previous one, in the sense that um, the, the weather was better, and uh, the ship could actually manage to reach 
74 degrees 01 south and they actually reached the coast it, as i said so little was known about antarctica that it was difficult for them to realize whether this might have been an island or whether it was the continent of antarctica which in fact it is and the good thing was that they named this part of the antarctic coast coats land in honor of their main sponsor the coats brothers and uh, and it was very good to see the people really happy to have reached this record of the farthest south in the Weddell Sea and having studied the ice and um, bathymetry. But the, um, uh, on the 7th of March, the ship was actually beset in the ice. And that could have been as tragic as the endurance of Shackleton that happened 10 years later. But they were very lucky. And on the 14th of March, the ship was released and, uh, and they could get underway again. Uh, they were not going back to Lori Island, but went back via Cape Town uh, and then went back to Scotland. The, um, interesting thing that they wanted to do was um, that they stopped in Ireland because they were supposed to arrive on the 21st of April, um, sorry, of July. So they waited in order to be then fated for their successful arrival on the July 21st, um, 1904. Let's talk now about the scientific, the large amount of scientific achievements of this expedition. It fulfilled a more comprehensive program than any other Antarctic expedition of its day. The expedition assembled a large collection of animals, marine and plant specimens, carried out extensive hydrographic, magnetic and meteorological observations. 100 years later, it has been said that the expedition's work had laid the foundation of modern climate change studies and that its experimental work has showed this part of the globe to be crucially important to the world's climate. We see the laboratories, the Scotia had two laboratories, uh, one for um, animals and one for microbiology, one for zoological studies and the other one for microscopic work. And um, they, uh, their attempt to, to uh, that was what was most important. They were not concerned about being the first to the South Pole or anything adventurous like that. Uh, therefore, the much scientific equipment was taken, as you can see, this was one of the two laboratories on board the ship, and the deck house of the Scotia was fitted out with these laboratories. Uh, this one, the zoological study that we see here, we can understand it's zoological because of all these penguins that are going to be studied and uh, placed there. They had actually in storage a, a thousand gallons, which is 4,550 liters of methylated spirit for the preservation of specimens. This was a, really a hazardous cargo because of the presence of naked flames from oil lamps and candles. But uh, nothing happened and they certainly managed to have an enormous number of specimens that they could bring back and study at a later stage. Very important is this Lucas sounding apparatus we see here in the two parts of it, uh, the part that goes into the sea and the one that is managed from on deck. Um, it, this is an automatic sounding machine in operation on the side of the Scotia. Uh, it could measure depths of up to about 11,000 meters or 6,000 fathoms. And the way it works is that a wire is paid out, passes over an outer measuring wheel, and the revolutions of the wheel get recorded on a dial, and uh, the corresponding number of fathoms is calculated. And during this process, there's a sprung break, which could stop the reel instantly, and was presented from acting by the tension of the wire 
under the weight of a sinker. When the sinker reached the bottom, the loss of tension caused the brake to operate, enabling the final depth to be read from the dial. Soundings were often taken uh, principally to establish the depth of the seabed or to record the temperature of the water at various depths by means of thermometers designed to withstand the enormous pressures encountered at the extreme depths involved. This is uh, in a laboratory, this is what this instrument looks like. And uh, they also used this Buchanan Richard water bottle to get samples. And you can see here how the enormous pressure actually bend and uh, deformed one of the bottles that went too far down in the water to, for its comfort, really. And uh, so the results were absolutely uh, marvelous in the sense that uh, uh, these are the results, the huge results of the bathymetrical surveys. This map uh, is entitled, I, you can just see it at the top there, Bathymetric Survey of the South Atlantic Ocean and Weddell Sea by William S. Bruce. It was uh, printed at the Edinburgh Geographical Institute by J. G. Bartholomew and published in the Scottish Geographical Magazine in August 1905. Illustrated an article of the same title by the same author under the heading, uh, Some Results of the Scottish National Antarctic Expedition. Among other things, the article described the dreadful conditions in which those operating the depth sounding apparatus had worked. Their efforts produced invaluable results, however, including effectively disproving the validity of Sir James Clark Ross's sounding taken in 1843 of 4,000 fathoms at 68 degrees 34, 12, 49 west, and providing also reliable data for discussion on the existence or otherwise of an Antarctic continent. We can give here a closer look at the bathymetric surveys uh, around the area of um, the Weddell Sea where the ship went. And did all these marked here are actually stations that they were doing. Very, very uh, careful and very precious work that he did. Now, we also um, had a, a project, a program of studying the deep sea deposit and this map again entitled deep sea deposit of the south atlantic ocean and weddell sea by jh harvey peary the scientist on board was printed again in the edinburgh geographical institute by jh bartholomew it was published in the same magazine the scottish geographical magazine in august 1905 and uh, illustrated uh, under the head in some results of the Scottish National Antarctic Expedition. The samples of deep, deposit, deep sea deposits were collected mainly by means of the sounding tube that was invented by J. Y. Buchanan for the Challenger Expedition of 1872-76. Here we have uh, um, the meteorological results that were taken from this hut, Omond House. And it, together here, in the, that was also published, uh, the deep water troll, trolling that was done, um, deep sea trolling from the ship. Um, you have to remember that uh, Bruce didn't have any money left. So these are fairly crude, uh, explanations and publications, unfortunately. Um, in a way, I like to sort of complete this talk about the expedition um, look, uh, with a tale of an iconic image, which probably is the one more recognized from the Scotia of a penguin listening to the bagpipes played by Gilbert Kerr. However, on a closer look, you can see that the penguin is actually attached to the leg 
of the Piper by a train hidden by the snow. So anyway, this is an amusing part that uh, it's become a very, very famous uh, polar image. Now let's look at the aftermath of the expedition. Uh, we see that the Scotia, uh, in the spring of 1905, the uh, the ship was sold for 5,019 pounds and nine pence to a Dundee consortium, which intended to return the vessel to the, to the original purpose of being a whaling ship. Initially, after a single unsuccessful trip to Greenland, the Scotia was laid up. Then after the sinking of the Titanic in April 1912, she was fitted with wireless and brought back into active service as part of the North Atlantic Patrol, Ice Patrol, once again with the same captain, the Captain Thomas Robson. What about Bruce himself? In 1904, the Royal Scottish Geographical Society recognized its achievement and the achievements of the Scottish National Antarctic Expedition by awarding the gold, this uh, gold medal to Bruce, the expedition's organizer and leader. The um, RSGS president, Sir John Murray, presented it to Bruce at Millport on the 1st of Clyde on his return from the Antarctic. This, in the same year, the, um, the Royal Scottish Geographical Society Silver Medal was awarded to Captain Thomas Robertson, the master of the Scotia. And in 1905, Robert C. Mossman, the expedition meteorologist, also received the Silver Medal. And bronze medals were awarded to the remaining scientific staff, the zoologist Wilton, the botanist Rudmus Brown, the surgeon and geologist Harry Peary, the artist Cooperson, and the taxidermist Alistair Ross. Um, it took quite a bit longer for the Royal Geographic society however to award a medal to bruce in fact uh, the gold medal of the society was uh, awarded to him only in 1910 uh, remember that uh, there had been a, a strong disagreement with markham who was championing the national british antarctic expedition with robert falcon scott so anyway, Bruce in the end got the Patron's Medal for exploration in the Arctic and the Antarctic. But the, the crowning uh, value and achievement of um, W.S. Uh, Bruce is having founded the Scottish Oceanographical Laboratory. See, what happened was that in any expedition, when all the specimen and data arrive they need to be kept in a place that could be actually useful and um, where people can carry on studying which can be uh, looked at by students and unfortunately this is what's mostly missing because at the end of an expedition usually there isn't much money left for this second very very important subsequent work um bruce in a way was lucky because he had sold the ship so with those five thousand pounds of the ship he actually founded the this base for his uh, um thing for his items on the expedition in the oceanographical laboratory that was actually in uh, Nicholson Street in Edinburgh. And it was also a museum. He really had the ambition that uh, it should become the Scottish National Oceanographic Institute. And you can see how important his connections that he had forged in the preceding decades were because it was actually this museum uh, this scottish oceanographical laboratory was opened by prince albert the first of monaco in 1906 so in these premises bruce housed the meteorological oceanographic equipment in preparation for possible future expedition 
And it also, it was a place where other fellow explorers could gather. Nansen Shackleton, who, by the way, had become the Secretary General, the Royal Scottish Geographical Society at the time, and also Roald Amundsen. In 1914, there was discussions to find more permanent homes, both for Bruce's collection and following the death that year of the oceanographer Sir John Murray for the specimens and the library of the Challenger expedition. And Bruce proposed that a new center should be created as a memorial to Murray. There was a unanimous agreement to proceed, but the project was curtailed by the outbreak of war and not, it was never revived. The Scottish Oceanographical Laboratory, as we see it here, uh, continued until 1919. Bruce was in poor health and he was forced to close it. And sadly, its contents were dispersed. Some went to the Royal Scottish Museum, some to the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, and some to the University of Edinburgh. What was important really was the publication of the uh, Scottish National Antarctic Expedition scientific reports. These, uh, at considerable cost and much delay, were published between 1907 and 1920, apart from one which was not published at the time, which was Bruce's own log. At the time of, um, after the Scottish National Expedition had started, there wasn't really a lot of interest in Britain about it. Um, you know, the North South Pole and Captain Scott took on quite a lot of the national interest. But his work was uh, highly praised uh, in, within the scientific community but he struggled to raise the funding to publish the result. And in a way, he blamed uh, Clements Markham for the lack of national recognition. And uh, we see here in this leaflet that uh, it was announced in volume three, Botany, parts one to 11 with the content and volumes that had already been published were volume two for physics, volume four for zoology, volume five also zoology. As you see, no volume one, which would have been the a log of the Scotia Bruce's own log. And uh, one has to wait. There was also another botanical expedition, uh, the results that were published in a small leaflet. But we had to wait until 1992 for the publication of the last uh, book, the last log of the expedition from the Edinburgh University Press. And uh, it was edited by Peter Speak, who by, uh, from the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge. Incidentally, Peter Speak was the organizer of the Master in Polar Studies that I attended. And it was a really painstaking and very accurate work that Peter Speak did to you know, help the memory of um, W.S. Bruce. And this is also important because it enabled polar researchers to see the expedition for the first time from the point of view of Bruce himself, as nearly all previous publications on the subject had been written by others. The work effectively represents volume one of the scientific results of the voyage of the steam yacht Scotia, which Bruce himself had been unable to publish. We just uh, closed here, remembering that uh, despite uh, um, what may seem uh, little recognized value of uh, his expedition, there's a legacy also in the name places like the Scotia Ark, the Scotia Sea and Scotia Ridge were all named in honor of the expedition. And Bruce died sadly quite young at the age of 54 on October 28, 1921. Thank you for listening and I hope that it has given a better understanding of um, an expedition that is still regarded as exceedingly valuable for the world of Africa. Antarctic Oceanography. Thank you very much.